the school. Life is a school for you to all of us to learn about ourselves. We can't run away and hide. The power of one mind can shine into another because all the lamps of God were lit by the same spark. It is everywhere and it is eternal. I love this part. In many, only that spark remains. For the great rays are obscured. Yet God has kept the spark alive so that the rays can never be completely forgotten. If you but see the little spark, if you but see just a little spark, you will learn of the greater light. For the rays are there unseen. And perceiving that spark will heal. But knowing the light will create. Yet in the returning, the little light must be acknowledged first. In going home, that little light must be acknowledged first. For the separation that you're experiencing was a descent from magnitude into littleness. Yeah. But the spark is still as pure as the great light because it is the remaining call of creation. Put all your faith in it and God himself will answer you. Mm. How, how beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm. You know, the power of the one mind, where does it, um, where, where did God light the spark? All the lamps of God, all the lamps of God were lit by the same spark. I love that. You imagine God, infinite being, just going like that. And all of us were lit up. And some of us, you know, are stepping into this great ray of love and light and joy and truth. And there's still people who've that little spark just flickering in the corner. And what the truth is saying yeah, to yeah. us is yeah. that if you remember the great rays that came that spark came from within each of one of us. Focusing on that. Isn't focusing it? on that is how you start to wake up one another. You know, the light within my mind, if I'm in touch with the light within my mind, me seeing you that way will help you light up your mind, whether you believe so or not, Mikey, whether you believe so or not, Jenny. So if we all went out and started practicing just the remembering of the light within each individual's mind, of yeah. their holy mind, that they were created from a great ray. That's how we join. We join yeah. by remembering who we really are together, rather than what the ego will do, which is yeah. judge. Judgment is the only tool the ego has in its armory. When it goes for its armory, it finds its biggest tool, and it's judgment. <laughs> That's the ego's tool, because what judgment does, judgment okay. keeps you separate from each other. Judgment that you are a man, I'm a woman, you are black, I'm white, you are old, I am. All of those judgments, which may not seem bad on the outset, which may not even seem like, what's wrong with that? Is a judgment that separates you. Whereas the remembrance yeah. of the light within me is the light within you that we came from the same light. What does that do? It pulls us together. It joins us together. So you realize that every choice I make can either, either to separate me from my brother or join me with my brother. And that's how we start waking up, is that we find and remember the light within ourselves and see it outwardly. That's how, and that's how we heal. We were talking yesterday about um, when people get ill um, and they're in hospital, how is it we respond to them? So my, Susie was um, at the group yesterday was asking about how she views a friend of hers that's in hospital who is currently suffering from... Um, uh, maybe a tumour or some sort of problem in her body. Yeah. And what the Course in Miracles teaches us is that um, when we seek to separate from each other and judge one another, what we're engaging in is a form of attack. An attack is uh, an attack against our re real, authentic self, which is a holy divine child of God. So if we're attacking ourselves because we believe we're limited and mortal and and uh, separate from that which is whole, therefore we're going to experience the consequences of attacking, which means we're going to feel guilty and then we think we deserve punishment. So the part of the course I was reading yesterday was called The Decision to Forget. And I'll just take bit, ex, small bits from it, to, 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 so, which, which is what I read yesterday to Susie. 
It says this, unless you first know something, you cannot disassociate it. Knowledge must precede disassociation, so that disassociation is nothing more than your decision to forget something. What has been forgotten then appears to you to be fearful, but only because the disassociation is a, an attack on the truth. You are fearful because you have forgotten, and you have replaced your knowledge by an awareness of dreams because you are afraid of your disassociation, not of what you have disassociated. When what you have disassociated is accepted, it ceases to be fearful. When you attack, you are denying yourself. You are specifically teaching yourself that you are not what you are. Your denial of reality precludes the acceptance of God's gift because you have accepted something else in its place. Your ego. If you understand that this is always an attack on truth, so every time you believe in the validity of your ego and your small personal self, the Course is saying, if you understand that this is always an attack on the truth of who you are, which is the truth is God, you will realize why it always is fearful. And if you further recognize that you are part of God, you will understand why it is that you always attack yourself first. So all attack is self-attack. It cannot be anything else. Arising from your own decision not to be what you are, it is an attack on your identification. Attack is thus the way in which your identification, the true identification as a holy, innocent, divine child of God, is lost to you. Because when you attack, you must have forgotten what you are. And if your reality is God's, when you attack, you are not remembering Him. This is not because He is gone, but because you are actively choosing not to remember Him. And the Course then says this, Do you realize the complete havoc this makes of your peace of mind? If you realize the complete havoc this made on your peace of mind, you could not make such an insane decision. You only make such a decision only because you still believe that decision can get you something you want. It follows then that what you want is something other than the peace of mind, but you have not considered what it must be. Yet the logical outcome of your decision is perfectly clear. If you will only look at it, by deciding against your reality, you have made yourself vigilant against God and his love. And it is this vigilance that makes you afraid of to remember him. And it goes on to talk about your ego being the god of sickness, your ego being that which you worship and idolize. And um, as a result of believing you are separate um, and your brother is separate from you, how is it you help heal one another in, in that state? And it says this. What comforter can there be for the sick children of God except his power through you? Remember that it does not matter where in the sonship, the where in the universal oneness of all things, God is accepted. It doesn't matter where in that universal oneness that God is accepted, his love is accepted. He is always accepted for all of us. When your mind receives him, the remembrance of him awakens throughout everyone. That's really powerful. So heal your brothers simply by accepting God for them. Your minds are not separate and God has only one channel for healing because he has but one son. God's remaining communication link with all his children joins them together and them to him. To be aware of this is to heal them because it is the awareness that no one is separate, so no one is sick. You heard. To believe that a child of God can be sick is to believe that part of God can suffer. Love can ne cannot suffer because it cannot attack. The remembrance of love therefore brings invulnerability with it. So do not side with sickness in the presence of a child of God, even if they believe in it. For your acceptance of love in Him acknowledges the love of God He has forgotten. Your recognition of Him as part of God reminds Him of the truth about Himself, which is He is denying. And ask yourself this, would you strengthen your brother's denial of love 
and thus lose sight of yourself? Or would you remind him of his wholeness and remember your creator with him? Uh, so that was really powerful for us yesterday to remember that when someone in our life is sick, my brother was sick two weeks ago and is still very sick now, is what are we choosing to focus on? Are we choosing to focus on the limited mortal self that most people believe they are? Or we're choosing to side with the infinite love which we know we really are, which is our, the love of our creator, the love of our source, the love of who we really are. What is it we're focusing on will determine the experience that person has. So we can either decide to, to limit someone by seeing them as limited and ill and suffering and, and join them with that and reinforce it for them. Or we can choose to not see them as that and choose to see them as completely innocent, completely whole and lovable and loving and an innocent child of God. That doesn't mean you have to do anything. It just means you can turn up at the hospital, be very present with them, hold their hands, be very loving, but not buy into the illusion of they are limited. And that's how you experience the wholeness with your brother, is by joining with them from that space of love, that you are not, you believe that you are suffering, and you are, but I'm not going to join you in that belief. I'm going to see, see you as you really are which is a child of God, which is completely fully whole. I think to, to really, for me, to really have that belief and really see that, I have to go past the belief in death, that death means something. Yeah. So, so you see the circularity in the process is that I create the thoughts of separation, that I am separate, I am isolated, I am alone. I then project those thoughts outward as my choice. I then learn that because I then experience myself as that, such as the power of my mind, and then it reinforces my belief that originally created those thoughts. So all this is simply saying is shift the choice of thoughts. Shift the, the ways of perceiving from separate, isolated, limited, to infinite, innocence, unlimited, eternal. And that is the experience you will have. It's a shift in perception. Mm -hmm. you know? so, I'm, so we're teaching ourselves what we need to learn because for all our years on the planet in this physical reality, we have learned a system of thinking through the ego that we are separate. And all this is telling us now is that you need to change that perception if you are to see correctly, which is that you are not separate. You are infinitely joined with each other under the one Christ mind, that which is infinitely love and joy and innocent but you simply have forgotten that through following the wrong teacher, that being your ego. So when we see someone sick, it's mm -hmm. to go, they have forgotten themselves. They are suffering. I will not join them in that suffering, but I'm going to be fully present there, witnessing for them the truth that they have forgotten for themselves. So I can be with you, but the way I perceive you will be different. And why is that so important? Because you will then experience yourself as that. Don't forget, we're all mirrors for each other. Yeah. So if I look at the mirror of you, and see joy and love and innocence and wholeness expressed there, then that's the mirror for me. <laughs> and I'm going to experience that in my life. But if I see you as separate and limited and suffering, that's what I'm going to experience in my life, and I'm going to believe that I'm also limited and separate and will suffer. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm fat to say anything. But it's a release from fear. It's, it's a release from fear, yes. It's, I keep wanting to say butt butt. Yes, but 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 yes, you know, it's it's recognizing that the the the, uh, that the divine in me is also in you. So that's my way of, of connecting. It's every every culture oh, in every aspect of our world, fire is a symbolic uh, a symbolic expression yeah, of something divine. Yeah. From the yes. tribes in Africa for purification rituals, for rites of passage, to the church lighting of the candles, yeah, yeah. to it's. 
and that kind of kind of is a it is a symbolic reflection of what we know to be true. Mm -hmm. You know, when you really look at your life, your life is just really filled with symbolic expressions mm -hmm. of what you know and believe yeah. to be true. Whether that is true or not is another story, but your life is filled with symbolic expressions of yeah. what you believe in your life. And fire always unites us because it kind of takes us back to that we are something infinitely greater than what we think we are. The fire is like a purification. It represents purification. It burns away anything that gets into its space. So literally the fire is for me representation of the truth, the word, that which burns away all, all things that are not in line with the truth. So if the truth is the fire and anything that is not a fire comes into the fire, it yeah. will burn it away. But or if truth, bring the light. Or, 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 and, or is, and at the same time it's giving light, light. around it and warmth, and comfort, and security. So from the little f f candle, my little one pound tea light I get from home base, which doesn't burn all the way through, anyway, I'm going to take I know, where we think, it's, it's the place, it's where it's in the place. Yeah, That's I like why. it every morning, yeah. and I do my reading it before I, before I go off it. I was saying to... There's a little cold bit in the middle, isn't there? That's right, yes. Because I, mean, yeah. I used to put, use it with oil. Yeah. An oil lamp. It's an, an oil, oil lamp, lamp and it yeah. just got so dirty. And what, what, what is this? What, what? Every morning. Just lighting a candle in the morning. Every morning. For me, so it's this sim it is symbolic, a symbolic expression. Thing. So for me, it is to remember that yeah. light within yeah. Yeah. and yeah. in everyone else. Mm -hmm. And the gra it brings me to that point of gratitude. Andrew's been doing it lately. That yeah. point of gratitude, absolute gratitude of remembering everything that I have and I'm grateful for. And that doing that every morning starts the day. Yeah. Yeah. from that place yeah. and to reinforce to yourself and to re yeah. you are the light and the way yeah. and the truth yeah. you know Jesus didn't come here to say that I'm separate from you mm -hmm. and I'm greater than you because I can walk on water and I can turn but he said no I've come here to show you all that you are you the are light the, the truth and the yeah. way because guess what we if we embody the truth fully can do exactly what he came and did with his ministry. We all have the power and the limitless availability to do that if we somehow just drop out of the ego way of living into this loving extension way of living, which is what Jesus' ministry was all about, extending love wherever he went unconditionally, without reservation, without judgment. And um, so that's the kind of, the light for me it reminds me that I am the light and the way and the truth if I embody yeah. it and teach yeah. it and learn it myself. And I can only do that by the Course says by sharing it. By, by sitting and sharing that with others. So yeah. I'm reminding myself, doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, by me sharing it, I'm teaching it and therefore learning it. Why have you got two ears? Because you need to hear it twice. Mm -hmm. Whatever comes out of the mouth, you need to hear it twice because you need to remind yourself in a world which teaches you that you are a fearful, limited, mortal individual that's going to suffer and die at one point in a world that teaches you fear every single day from your news reports to your newspapers to your friends' conversations. You need to hear a message that tells you something different, that you are eternal, that you are love, that you can change the way you experience your reality if you listen to another voice, you know? So that's for me why I like it. It's cardboard. PJ, we were talking earlier yeah. on about cardboard cutouts. You know those yeah, life-size yeah, yeah. cardboard yeah. cutouts sure. you see like, in comedy sketches? Uh -huh. 40, that guy, um, John Cleese, used to be. Yeah. You know, he used to, he, Manuel, do you ever used to watch 40 Towers? Yeah, sure. So, you know, Manuel, there was one scene where he had. He, he's always having, you know what I'm talking about, 40 yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, when Ma he's always having a go at Manuel. Oh, one yeah. day, in one of the episodes, Man Manuel wasn't <laughs> on the show. So, they had a cardboard <laughs> cutout of, of, of Manuel, and he would just be having a go at Manuel. So, I was saying earlier on, that's what we do all the time. We walk yeah. around with our ideas and beliefs about what life should be, or a as card or what, mostly what people should be. Yes, and, and, we, and we carry these cardboard cutouts of people and things and when we get into situations we plonk it down in front of us and we and we have a go at it as if we that, that oh, yeah. really is we real and all we're, all we're doing is just stopping out. us from actually accepting what is happening right now rather than interposing on the what is yeah. happening with our own ideas and concepts and beliefs because i agree but you see all what you're saying now yeah. is all concepts right John, yeah. your world will only change when you start using words such as I am creating, I am responsible for, yeah, okay. I am wanting to experience. And when you stop using the words you, they or them, okay, your reality fine. will change. That's when you take full responsibility for everything you're creating in your life. If you're experiencing any sort of discomfort in your interpretations of your life, yeah. then you need to change your interpretations if you don't want to experience discomfort. So if you come to a meeting where you're experiencing some sort of discomfort about how the meeting is going, 
then you simply have to understand that your interpretation yeah. of the meeting is giving you discomfort, not the meeting itself. So rather than deal with the yeah. meeting, deal with your interpretation, your cardboard cutout of what you think meetings should look like. That's all you're ever meeting in your life are your interpretations. So if your interpretations don't bring you peace, then you need, you need to change them. No one else. I couldn't agree more. So I then sit with that for a while and work with why is it my interpretations about how things should be yeah. are stopping me yeah. from experiencing the peace that I want. That's all, we have, that's all we can ever do. And I do it to myself whenever I'm in a situation with someone and I'm feeling out of peace, I'm feeling as if I'm judging them, I'm feeling as if I need to say something about them. I stop myself because that's my ego. I stop myself from trying to tell anyone else what they should do to make me happy because that is not their job. That's me abdicating responsibility for my own happiness. And I get quiet within myself and I scan myself like a radar. Where is this coming from? It's coming from my need to be right. It's coming from my wanting to be validated. It's coming from my need to be heard. And that is ego. Your real true nature is an infinite, innocent child of God which needs nothing. So I need to bring myself back to that place by reminding myself of that, and then that need to be heard then falls away. But when, I, when, you're, when your ego is out there engaging with other egos, the recipe is simply just disaster. Yeah. So just, just learn to work with your interpretations and let them go as they arise, because they, are, they, they, they really don't take you anywhere. Um that there's always been from different sources, different ways, yeah. an attempt to create a form, a structure yes. to pin it down. Yeah. And it's always made me laugh because if well, all funny. the groups in the world yes, try to do that, when it's, I not this group, be, it's not going to um, work, is it? Probably two years ago, a year and a half ago, people were saying to me, what's your group about on a Sunday? And yeah. I said, well, there isn't any structure, there isn't any format. And I was kind of, people, people love to have structure mm -hmm. because it's the nature of the ego to know what's happening mm -hmm. because it can't deal with the unknown which is a big play on it can't deal with it. The, the, the unknown of the, 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 the void, the mystery of God which resides in the, big, in, in, the, in, the, in the whole experience of your life. The ego's all going, suspicious of what's that? What's that? I'm about to be annihilated. What's that? So we are like that. We don't deal with, we hate not having structure because we, it gives us security. It gives us a, 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 a room to, to kind of fathom and walk and and relate to when actually when you take that away and let it be exactly what it's meant to be by guidance rather than control things will then turn out exactly the way they're meant to turn out and actually can only be the way they are. Can so, I say something about yeah. that perception because um, yeah. I, I, you know, often when we talk about stuff it's really when we then relate it to real events we yeah. can lose track of actually what what we're talking about yes. and I don't know John but for me one of the one of the, my biggest hates and I'm going to use that word, hate, is somebody who's got headphones on, sits next to me on the train, right? If they get on the train, they get in my carriage, and I can hear them. I've got really bad hearing. I can't hear most things, but I can hear them at the other end of the carriage, right? <laughs> and invariably, they'll come and sit next to me, and the rage inside me, and the dirty looks I give them, it's like, okay, <laughs> nobody else is reacting, mm. so perhaps this is all about how I'm perceiving it, uh, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, okay. So... Yeah. In this crazy week and last week, and you know, I've been trying to do it, but I actually noticed that when this person sat next to me on the train, I thought, why me? Why? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. In, I fact, wonder why. in fact, I had a lovely elderly gentleman sitting next to me, nice and quiet, and he got up and he moved away to an empty seat that somebody pinned, and then the person with the headphones came. I was like, okay, here we go. Here's lessons. Mikey's got to proceed and learn something. <laughs> and this person next to me, and I just went into, if it doesn't bother anybody else, perhaps it doesn't have to bother me. Yeah. And I went off into something else. And before I knew it, we were in East Grinstead, and this person sat next to me the whole time with their headphones, right. beating away, and I hadn't heard a single thing. Yeah. And so it was, it, was, it was just such a, a literal moment yeah. of literally taking that perception yeah. of whatever it was and yeah. just changing it. And it's yeah. not about, you know, I've talked back to Marta Ketchup last yeah. week from mm. Marmite and stuff, but it was, it was I, I actually did it. Yeah. And that's <laughs> it all in the world. That is that's that's all in the mm. world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm saying you're talking about things happening in the world. Well, but my perception that it was happening in the world, but it yeah, took well, me to a place that I was, I was peace. I, I, it? Peace, it was peace. I, went in, I yeah, found yeah. that spark mm. that you're talking about, and I was yeah. rum rummaging and playing in there. Yeah. Then before I knew I was in East Grinstead, and that's where we practice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's, where we get that's practice. the world. <laughs> the that, we live in a lab. Yeah, sorry, PJ. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Do you mind if I say something? No, no, no. Yeah. 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 Um, with Irish accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. I said, you know, I didn't think these places existed anymore. And go back to what 
John was saying about you know the fire and flame and how we all you know I suppose worship it in our own way, but it brings back my childhood memories yes. in, in Ireland yeah. because it's been I don't know why I'm here, but I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just to, just to know one thing, Peter, we're never guided in life to do anything other than what we're meant to do. So this is perfect. It's a perfect expression of really when you kind of reach a limit. Everyone's got a limit in their life. It's called the, 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 the pain, threshold of pain. Yeah. Okay. And you, you've, you, you come to Forest Row and you'll meet loads of people who have done exactly what you've done and have stayed for a long time because they wanted another way to exist in their life because the other way which they ran from or came from wasn't working. I know for myself that you know I got to a part of my life in early 2008, um, nine where I did exactly what you did. I packed my bags, left wife and children and home, family, friends, career, job, everything. I said I can't do it anymore. I had enough. I was the eternal optimist, always bubbly, smiley, happy-go-lucky. Underneath all of that was a reservoir of pain which I didn't want to acknowledge. I didn't even know what's their brother. So. When life is going really well and you are on that euphoric stage of everything is fine, there is that side of us which is still very miserable, depressed and in pain. That came up for me, so the only way for me to deal with it was to do what you did, was to run away from my experience. I ended up in Scotland. <laughs> you ended up, I was in Scotland, I went to a... But ended up in Scotland wasn't enough for me, I wanted to go completely rural. So I then decided to take a boat from Scotland to Arran. And when I got to the Isle of Arran, no, I wanted to go further. So I took a dinghy boat to a tiny island in the middle of the ocean <laughs> where there was a Buddhist retreat. And never been on my own at all since I was a child. So this was kind of like my first adventure. And that's when my whole, my whole life was turning around for me to process what was going on and me to ask the big questions. Why? Why am I here? What's my purpose? What do I want? Is there a God?